Hello, my name is Walid Brinjikji, and today I'll be presenting uh, part two on this multi-part lecture series on dangerous anastomoses. And this part is focused on uh, petrocavernous anastomoses. So there are three major anastomotic areas within the petrocavernous region. Number one, the petrous ICA and associated petrous branches. Number two, the clival branches, and number three, the cavernous sinus. So for the uh, petrous region anastomoses, you know, we have our, our uh, pathways including internal carotid artery to the mandibular artery, to the eustachian branch of the ascending pharyngeal artery, to the ascending pharyngeal artery. And then we have our ICA to the carotico-tympanic artery to the inferior tympanic artery of the ascending pharyngeal artery, and then the ascending pharyngeal artery. And then we have the vidian artery to the distal internal maxillary artery. For clival anastomoses, the ICA has the meningohypophyseal trunk, which has an anastomosis with the medial clival artery of the ascending pharyngeal artery and then the neuromeningeal trunk of the ascending pharyngeal artery. There's also the inferolateral trunk, which connects to the lateral clival artery of the ascending pharyngeal artery, and then to the ascending pharyngeal artery neuromeningeal trunk. And then for cavernous sinus anastomoses, these are much more numerous. Uh, we have the MHT with the marginal artery of the tentorium, and the petrosquamosal branch of the middle meningeal artery. We have the ILT with the lateral clival artery, and then the artery of the foramen lacerum, and then the ascending pharyngeal artery. ILT with the superior or tentorial branch, and then cavernous branches of the middle meningeal artery. Also, the ILT has an anteromedial branch, which anastomoses with orbital branches of the middle meningeal artery an anterolateral branch, which connects with the artery of the foramen rotundum, and then the internal maxillary artery, and then a posteromedial branch, which connects to the artery of the foramen ovale, and then the accessory meningeal artery, and then internal maxillary artery. So now I'll just go over some uh, cases that kind of highlight these anastomoses and, and the importance of these anastomoses. So case number one is a sigmoid sinus dural arteriovenous fistula, which is supplied by the carotico-tympanic artery, as well as the ascending pharyngeal artery. So here uh, we see the uh, internal carotid artery injection, and we see a faintly opacified branch right here. And this is the carotico-tympanic artery. And it, it, you don't really see it in normal angiograms. I think it comes out best when you have a, a tumor or a fistula or, or some sort of hypervascular lesion. And you can see that there's faint venous blush right here coming from that carotico-tympanic artery from the petrous ICA. You also see the MHT there and the uh, ILT. Um, you know, the ILT is also going to converge on the, the site of the fistula. And then here's the external carotid artery injection where we see the uh, ascending pharyngeal artery supply uh, to the dural arteriovenous fistula as well as the posterior auricular. So these branches here are converging at the same location that that carotico uh, tympanic branch and the ILT are converging. And you could see that if you're in the setting of, of doing a, a liquid embolic uh, agent uh, embolization with onyx or something, you have to be careful to make sure that you're not injecting under a high pressure state and uh, forcing embolic material into these tiny ICA branches and then resulting in, in anterior circulation ischemia. So this just kind of shows this in, in more overlay. You can see here that carotid and tympanic artery with filling of that sigmoid sinus. And then you can see how that is anastomosing with the region of the uh, ascending pharyngeal artery and posterior auricular artery. By the way, this took me a while to make. So again, ICA to the carotico tympanic artery, to the inferior tympanic artery of the ascending pharyngeal artery, and then to the ascending pharyngeal artery. 
So case number two is a Cognard type 5 fistula, which is located in the hypoglossal canal with ascending pharyngeal artery and meningohypophyseal trunk supply. And I'll, I'll uh, have a lecture on, on dural arteriovenous fistulas in, in the coming weeks, but a Cognard type 5, just to remind you, is basically a fistula that has a spinal uh, venous drainage. So here we see the MRI on this patient. You can see the high uh, signal and patchy enhancement of the um, medulla. Uh, needless to say, this patient you know, had uh, multiple misdiagnoses prior to uh, the discovery of the dural artery venous fistula. You know, some people thought this could be clippers, lymphoma, or, or some, site, some sort of um, you know, an infectious process. You can see here on the uh, MR angiogram, that you have this branch of the ascending pharyngeal artery which is going into the hypoglossal canal and you can see this dilated vein in the hypoglossal canal um, as well as uh, in, in the actual uh, uh, condyle in, in the actual uh, osseous substance of the condyle and you also see this uh, you know uh, vessel here uh, running along the, the clivus uh, as well that is supplying the, the fistula and this is a superior slice to, to this right here here is the angiogram of the ascending pharyngeal artery, and you can see that uh, neuromeningeal trunk, which is going into this uh, vein or fistula in the hypoglossal canal, and then draining into the anterior and posterior spinal veins, resulting in that medullary venous congestion and cervical myelopathy. Now here on the ICA injection, uh, for, forgive the, uh, the spasm here, um, but you can see here that there's this clival artery um, that is going to supply the actual fistula itself as well. So it's the infralateral trunk to the lateral clival artery, and then you have the fistula. And then if you kind of converge these things, you can see here um, that you know, even after we had uh, finished our embolization of the ascending pharyngeal artery, now when we do the internal carotid artery injection, you can actually see how this has now become the dominant supply uh, to the fistula. And, and for this uh, embolization here, we did not use a liquid embolic. We used, you know, particles, and we thought that because this was the dominant supply on the initial angiogram, if we included this, you know, we could, you know, slow down the fistula enough and, and maybe. Um, it could resolve spontaneously. We didn't want to use liquid embolics because of that uh, anastomosis, but then you can see here that uh, you know, we were kind of in a, in a world of hurt because now we have this uh, ILT to lateral clival artery, which is uh, providing robust supply uh, to the fistula. And, and needless to say, that, that patient went on to get surgery and, and did very well with, with, uh, with, with surgical ligation of the fistula. So the anastomosis here was the ICA to ILT to the lateral clavo artery of the ascending pharyngeal artery and then to the ascending pharyngeal artery neural meningeal trunk. So the branch of the ascending pharyngeal artery that's going to the hypoglossal canal supplying the hypoglossal nerve. Case number three, again showing a nice example from ICA occlusions. It's a chronic ICA occlusion with the ascending pharyngeal artery to infralateral trunk anastomosis. So you can see here, you know, we're doing our, uh, our uh, common carotid artery angiogram and we have opacification of the uh, internal carotid artery. So we have the neuromeningeal trunk of the ascending pharyngeal artery and then we have the lateral clival artery, the ILT, and then the internal carotid artery. So again, ICA, ILT, lateral clival artery of the ascending pharyngeal artery, and then ascending pharyngeal artery, neuromeningeal trunk. Here's a case of a uh, juvenile nasal angiofibroma with supply from the mandibulovidian artery, the artery foramen ovale, and the internal maxillary artery. So you can see here on this MRI, we have this uh, robustly enhancing uh, lesion uh, that's you know located arising from the uh, sphenopalatine foramen uh, in the young patient. You'd be thinking primarily of a juvenile nasal angiofibroma. In an older patient, you'd be thinking about uh, squamous cell uh, uh, carcinoma or um, you know, other types of uh, salivary malignancies as well. 
So on this ICA run, uh, we see that there's actually supply to the tumor from these branches of the internal carotid artery, including the mandibulovidian artery, as well as the artery of the foramen ovale. So this is the site of the foramen ovale and the artery just dipping down right here to supply the superior aspect of the tumor. And the mandibulovidian artery is going to supply the posterior aspect of the tumor. On the internal maxillary artery injection, you see the, the hypervascular tumor. And, and this is a case where probably half the supply was coming from ICE branches and the other half was from the, the ECA branches. And we do the best we can with, with embolization. So in this setting, um, we know that that dangerous anastomosis is, is present, that those vessels are, are, are open. So we make sure we're not um, injecting uh, small particles, we use larger particles, you know, maybe five to 700 microns or three to 500 microns. Um, and then we also make sure that we're not injecting it from a, a wedged uh, position. So just kind of superimposing uh, the ECA and ICA run, you can see here the um, a mandibulovidian artery and the artery of foramen ovale supply. And that's superimposing the uh, ECA run, showing that a lot of the uh, tumor blush from the ECA has substantial overlap with what we're seeing from the uh, ICA. And then you can see here this bony overlay, which kind of shows, you know, this uh, artery, the foramen ovale going through uh, foramen ovale very nicely. So ICA to Vidian artery to distal I, uh, IMAX, and then we also have ICA to the ILT to the posterior medial branch to the artery, the foramen ovale, accessory meningeal artery, and then the IMAX. So this was uh, a case that I had uh, early in my, my fellowship, actually. It's a carotid pseudoaneurysm, and you can actually see uh, IC revascularization through the artery of the foramen ovale and the artery of the foramen rotundum. rotundum. So here, um, this is a, a young uh, patient that had uh, a tonsillar abscess uh, that resulted in uh, infectious pseudoaneurysm of the internal carotid artery right here, and you can see that right here. And then uh, here, we're injecting uh, the right internal carotid artery with, or left internal carotid artery with a lot of reflux uh, into the ECA. You can see this huge pseudoaneurysm with sluggish flow. Um, and then uh, when we inject the um, ECA on the you know uh, AP view, you see that there's reconstitution of the internal carotid artery through this branch right here and this branch right here. So this branch right here is the artery of the foramen rotundum, which if you remember your your skull base anatomy and look closely at all your uh, CTs, you know it's superiorly located and you see it best in a coronal plane. So you know if you're looking at an AP, it's it's going to be going uh, horizontal or more um, on face, and then here you see the artery of the foramen ovale, which is going you know, superiorly to inferiorly, or inferiorly to superiorly to anastomose with the ILT, um, and then help revascularize the internal carotid artery. So in this patient, you know, we um, ended up uh, sacrificing the, the internal carotid artery, and then actually, you know, the, there was excellent cross filling from the contralateral side, um, but you can see that there was you know, reconstitution of the internal carotid artery through those uh, anastomotic channels. Yeah, so these are examples of cavernous sinus anastomoses, ICA to ILT, its anterolateral branch to the artery of foramen rotundum, then the IMAX, and then ILT to the posterior medial branch to the artery of the foramen ovale, accessory meningeal artery, then the IMAX. Here's another case of ICA occlusion with reconstitution through the uh, artery of foramen ovale as well as the meningolacrimal branch. So here uh, we see uh, uh, external carotid artery injection in this patient with a um, you know carotid occlusion. You see here the artery of the uh, foramen rotundum going to the ILT, and then you see here the middle meningeal artery, which is uh, connecting with the recurrent meningeal artery, lacrimal artery, ophthalmic artery, and then the internal carotid artery. Um, so, and then also here, you, you know, you, you can actually see, I think this would, you know, would, would be an artery foramen ovale maybe. So ICA to ILT to anterolateral branch to artery foramen rotundum to the IMAX. 
and then the orbital region anastomosis of ICA to ophthalmic artery, the lacrimal artery to the recurrent meningeal artery, MMA. And then here's a case of uh, artery of the foramen rotundum and transcavernous branches supplying a carotid uh, occlusion. So this patient has a, a, a carotid occlusion. Uh, we do our uh, common carotid artery angiogram. We see reconstitution of the ICA, and this is actually coming from the artery of the foramen rotundum to the ILT to the ICA. And then you can see that here on the AP, artery of the foramen rotundum to the ILT to the ICA. And then when we injected the contralateral uh, internal carotid artery, you can actually see here that there are these transcavernous anastomoses of the ILT that are going to connect with the contralateral ILT and then uh, open up the uh, cavernous segment of the left internal carotid artery as well. So just interesting, you know, the, the various ways uh, in, in which, um, you know, these anastomoses can, can open up and things that you don't typically see on, on a normal angiogram. So, nice example of the cavernous sinus anastomosis, so ICA to ILT, to its anterolateral branch, to the artery foramen rotundum, to the IMAX, then ICA to the ILT, to the anteromedial branch, to another anteromedial branch, then to the contralateral ILT, then the contralateral ICA. So, those are the uh, petrocavernous uh, anastomoses. And uh, for part three, we'll be discussing uh, anastomoses in the upper cervical region. And uh, this is kind of where the uh, uh, ascending pharyngeal artery uh, really gets to shine. And um, looking forward to sharing that part with you. Thank you very much.